Hello and welcome. Welcome back. If you're coming back to The Millionaire's Lawyer, we are thrilled to have you here and we are thrilled to have May Musk, a dear old friend uh, with us here today. Uh, we were trying to schedule this for a little while. I guess we saw each other a little bit back in, in uh, Boulder, Colorado and May started talking about her new book and she was on a, uh, a swing to promote the book. Uh, and so I said, well, we got to get you on the podcast as well to talk about the book. May, I think, was off. She was flying all over the place to promote the book. And now, of course, we've got COVID-19 which has grounded her along with everybody else. So we are happy to get her booked, happy to get her on the show. May, thanks for being here with us today. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Always lovely to see you. <laughs> yes, as we were just chatting offline, it's been a while. I guess we going back and we'll get into your book because you describe a lot of the things that, uh, uh, you do it sort of chronologically, sort of through your life, uh, different times in your life. Uh, and we were talking about when you and I met, I guess it was a earlier time in my life as well, going all the way back to university to uh, answer the question offline when you're saying how long ago was it, it's actually the 25th year reunion for our graduate, graduating class this year. Yeah. So it I went to- Under 30 years, so it's maybe 28 years. 28 years, if you can imagine. Yeah, when we would have, would have met. Yeah, yeah. So for yeah. My, my university, yeah. Queen's yeah. University- you haven't changed. Oh, that's right. And actually, I mean, it's amazing because you've only gotten more beautiful. Oh, uh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So you're on the book promotion tour. As I say, I, I take us back to that time because I'm obviously very good friends with uh, one of your sons, uh, Kimball, a uh, very good friend. And we continue to get together and continue to celebrate and take part in a lot of the festivities that we've always been able to enjoy over the years. And that goes way back to the years when uh, I was at university and you were coming to visit. Why don't we start there, talk about how those uh, get togethers occurred and how you discuss those in the book. Because as we just finished talking about, uh, you've, always been, uh, you've always been somebody that's uh, 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 more than willing to join the party and be, be a big part of the party. And you did that very much even going back to our university days, didn't you? Always, yes. Um, if you had a party, I was there. Uh, there's no need for me not to miss it. I've come to visit Kimball. <laughs> and so, uh, yes. Um, and then um, I would just, I, what I did with my three kids, because I, you know, I was in a rent-controlled apartment with minimum, um, just barely surviving. But whatever saving I had, I would go to each child once a month. So it would be Kimball one month, Elon one month, Tosca one month. And uh, then I would just treat them, maybe get them some food, get them some clothes, whatever savings I had, then I would just make them a little more comfortable. And then Kimball would cook for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love reading about that in, in the book because, as I say, I was one of the beneficiaries of those cooking events. And I remember you very, I remember very fondly you coming up to the university uh, for a visit. And it's great to read about in your book about how, you know, you were consciously treating your kids uh, with those visits. And, and upon those visits, I, I recall how there would be a big food shop and we were all university students. And you talked about in your book as well about how we lived in pretty, uh, pretty decrepit circumstances, didn't we? So. Very decrepit. I would sometimes come to the ghetto house that you all, you know, were <laughs> living in, and I would walk over pizza boxes you know, to, to just get in the, in the doorway. <laughs> oh, they were, I mean, it really was quite, I mean, at one point, uh, uh, I recall in, in Kimmel's house, the, the bathroom actually, the bathroom toilet leaked from one floor to the next. It was that bad. Uh, so, I mean, we lived in, you know, pretty meager circumstances as students, and that was by choosing. And so it was always very welcome when you would come. I remember there would be a big food shop, and then Kimball would do a huge cook, and we'd all feast like kings. It was wonderful to be there, and wonderful to see you back in those days. Yes, I know. And then I remember he often brought friends from, from um, uh, Queens to my apartment, my rent-controlled apartment in, in uh, Toronto, and then I would wake up in the morning and I'd just see bodies all on the carpet. I'd step over them, make my coffee, go back to my bedroom. <laughs> and carry on, yes. And it was, I mean, it's so much fun. And always, you always had an open door, always welcomed everybody. And everybody always, I've always felt at home. I've always felt like a part of the family. You guys have always included me, just swept us up and, and kept everybody, kept everybody together and kept everybody laughing. And your yeah. book, it's great because you actually talk about how you put on that, that bright face and you were uh, always willing to do that, but you were actually really working very hard at the time as well, weren't you? Yes, you hardly saw me. I would have been working every day, yeah, and night. 
<laughs> yeah, day and night, uh, of course, uh, as a, as a, uh, with your uh, dietetics pra- practice. And uh, you gave it a lot. Of, I remember friendly tips along the way to us starving students as well, saying don't pay attention to the latest fad, right? You'd always give us very, very good grounded advice. And you're still doing the same thing in your book, aren't you? Still doing the same thing because fad diets can be expensive and then not necessarily healthy. So I was always concerned that everyone has good health and can eat on a budget. That's right. Eat on a budget. So, I mean, for the purpose of the podcast here is for, for business owners and you've seen the full range of business owners, right? Uh, I mean, you've watched your own sons as well. I've, I've, I've also seen uh, the beginnings of a company all the way up to the huge, massive growth. But you see, in fact, you've been there for some of the lean years and some of the tough times to get the businesses going. What kind of things did you have to do to support your sons and your daughter, Tosca, as they were growing their own businesses? Well, when they needed financial help and I had some savings, then I would give it to them because I just thought they all three had good ideas and that um, it's the way to go for the future. And I mean, I didn't need savings, you know, I could live frugally (laughs) and, uh, and yeah, I supported them. I would have business meetings with them. You know, when I eventually moved to San Francisco, Mm -hmm. while while Zip2 was in uh, Silicon Valley, then I would go every Saturday morning and have a meeting with Elon and Kimball to discuss their business plans and what, what they've achieved that week and what we should aim for the next week. And I always did the Nordstrom breakfast show, first of all, either in San Jose or San Francisco or Sacramento at 8.30 in the morning. So then I could do it 8.30 till 9 as the runway show and then I could get to them by 11 a.m. so that I could do the business meeting. It was quite funny that. Um, Because I would rent a car on a Friday night, and then I had to return it by the Saturday night. Otherwise, I would have to pay more. So uh, so that's how I saw my kids on on weekends. Yeah, and you'd be up and down. I remember that. So in those days, again, to think about how many times we've, wonderful times we've had together. I was actually living with Elon at that time, at that uh, that three-bedroom we had in Palo Alto. And I recall you coming by, as you say, with the car, uh, picking up Elon, or you guys would meet at a restaurant. And uh, I, mean, I was working at Zip2 myself at the time, but I don't know if you realize, you wrote in your book a little bit how you support your kids uh, and you help them you know, with a little bit of money along, along the way, but it was more the support. And I mean, if you needed to be there rolling up your sleeves and scrubbing something or moving something, you I were scrubbed, certainly there, weren't you? I scrubbed and I moved things, that's for sure. And um, as I say, you only saw me on a Saturday because I only rented a car for one day. I couldn't afford it for a second day. So it was always Friday night or Saturday night. And it's amazing because it comes through in your book as you describe this. And you're very honest in your book. For anybody that's thinking, I mean, there's a lot of life tips in the book. And there's a lot of great storytelling as you describe uh, the evolution, I guess, of your life and the way it's intertwined with that of your kids. You offer wonderful advice throughout. And I'm struck by, again, reading the book uh, you know, and going through some of the uh, episodes and some of the times all the confidence that you always displayed, the way you always came in with a positive attitude and a smile on your face, no matter the situation. And there were some very tense times, weren't there? Oh, yes. It was, uh, for our, you know, you're financially in, in pain. You know, you actually feel a knot in your stomach because you know that if you are sick for a day or for three days, will I have enough food to feed my kids? And so what concerns me most about COVID-19 is It's the people that are losing their jobs Mm -hmm. because I don't know how I would have been able to feed my kids. So I don't know how they are managing because it's a very scary time for, for many families, for millions of families. And um, I really, that keeps me up at night at the moment because I, it's the fear that I think they must be going through. It's really hard. Yeah, and very much. I, had, I went through it for 20 years that I was always scared I wouldn't have enough food for the kids. And, um, but I always could live on a budget too. You know, we never went out to restaurants or, or movies or uh, I didn't have my hair done anyway, you know, or have a manicure or pedicure. Actually, I would do manicures and pedicures on Elon and Kimball. You can imagine how nasty that I don't that was. remember that. Yeah, when were you doing that? What years? All the way through school as well and Zip2 as well? well when, they went, when, when they went for interviews, I wanted them to look smart. And then, then I did go to, to Eaton's with Elon to get um, a suit for his first food, suit for um, his first business interview. And it was $99. And it was, I think it included two shirts, a tie and socks. So then we just need to get him shoes. And then he would wear the same suit every single day. 
That's so great. And you did, you did very similar. You described in your book, isn't it? Uh, a case of looking good. So you feel confident as you're going into a business pitch, right? Or a business meeting. Yes. Well, the thing is, I mean, uh, I always felt confident about, about all my three kids when they go for a, an interview because they are um, straight talkers and they highly intelligent <laughs> to, you know, that's mother talking, but now <laughs> obviously true. And, uh, and also enthusiastic about their work. And I thought, well, you know, what, what more do you want when you're going to employ someone? That's right, right? And you've instilled that in them from a very young age. You write about this, you talk about this, right? You basically supported them in their own interests and that's, that's worked out quite well, hasn't it? That's worked out very well, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we, well, the fortunate thing is that we're all in good health at the moment, as well as all my grandkids are, 11 grandkids. And, uh, and, but we just can't see each other. And, but that's, you know, just for a while, we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah, for this little while. And as you say, it's a scary time. Uh, I think the theme of your book, I mean, there's a few, I think a few things that run through it, but, uh, you know, by its very title, you know, A Woman Makes a Plan. Uh, and then gets through it, right? You've always done that. You've had an idea and you've been willing to do what it takes and then overcome it. Uh, so something like COVID-19 will be something as well that we overcome. And if you were, you are going through this as well, but if you were counseling a young person listening to this right now, what would you encourage them to do? I encourage them to, first of all, don't spend money. You know, you really can't, if you don't have it, if you don't, don't spend all your savings, you need to budget by eating carefully. Well, it's not like you can spend much money anyway. I mean, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't get takeout and you can cook for yourself. So that's about the best way for you to, um, to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it is kind of survival right now. Um, yeah, we'll survival. come out the other end of this though. And yeah. um, again, you've survived a lot. You describe a lot uh, in, in your book. Uh, and uh, you talk about how uh, things have grown and evolved. At one point uh, you talk about, you know, if you work hard, you'll get lucky or you'll, you'll be luckier the harder you work. What do you mean when you say that? Yeah, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Well, people always think I'm lucky. And, uh, and my kids say, well, she just worked hard all the time, you know. And uh, so that's, and, but that was one of my dad's sayings as well. He worked hard and my mom worked hard and they, were they lucky? Well, I guess, I think good health means you're lucky too. That, uh, but then I eat very well to maintain my health. I don't want to be, uh, have any of the um, underlying conditions that could lead to uh, poor health. Uh, that, but that's hard. It's really hard to eat well and maintain my weight. I have for the past 30 years, but before that I, I, I was up to 65 pounds heavier than I am now when I was a plus size model. And then I ate everything in sight, which was absolutely delicious. But now I have to really control it and it's worth it to be in good health. Yeah, I can't imagine. I, I was with, again, with great interest in your book, as you described being much heavier, right? Or being a plus, uh, a plus size model as well. Cause I've only known you as the uh, uh, very uh, svelte looking woman that you uh, are today. Uh, but I knew how hard you were working even at, at that time or describing it. Cause you'd say to us and you were, you know, quick, you would, wouldn't uh, shun a drink. You'd have a drink if uh, it was uh, being offered. You'd never overindulge. Uh, same thing. If there was a, uh, uh, some, a sweet or something like that, you'd, you'd take part of it, but you'd say, Hey guys, understand that this is an exception to the rule. We enjoy it for now. And then we'll work it off later. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, yeah, I had to immediately once, uh, because I can overdo sweet things too. But I remember when Tosca had a birthday party, um, uh, uh, all the girls came and, and she, uh, there was a cake. And so one of the girls said, this cake here? So, <laughs> so then everybody said, uh, what's, what's so surprising? So she goes to my uh, kitchen cupboards, she opens them, she says, Everything, there's no cake anywhere. There's nothing sweet, nothing to eat. Everything here makes you poop. <laughs> it was high fiber. <laughs> so that was so funny. <laughs> and you've just always been very strategic about uh, making sure, okay, and you say it in, this, in the book as well, if you're going to bring food, there's something sweet, take it with you. We'll enjoy it while it's here, but then take it with you. We don't want to be tempted later, do we? No, no, it's, it's like taking wine to an alcoholic. Uh, and telling them just have a sip every day. No, that's not going to work out. Don't bring me the sweet food because then I, there's, there's, uh, I can still eat as, you know, 
an unlimited amount. The wheels just come off. Yeah, you'd be able to keep food. Now you guys have, you all, I mean, you, your children have a very health, healthy outlook with food as well. You know how to celebrate, you know how to enjoy it. Uh, yeah. Kimball, of course, is, uh, uh, I recall, so one of my stories uh, uh, to talk after we sold Zip2 and Zip2 uh, uh, was, was a success that it was. I remember Kimball obviously going off to the uh, Culinary Institute in, in New York Mm-hmm. And I remember him working very, very hard. And I remember thinking to myself, you don't need to be working like this right now. Uh, you, could, you could open your own restaurant already. He said he wanted to learn. He wanted to make sure he was learning the steps to become the successful chef that he is today. Yes, well, I remember because then I would go there at 11 at night when he's off duty. That's when the restaurant closed. And then the staff, all the, all the students would eat. And then he would bring me all the food that, that was left over. And then we would have dinner at 11 at night. Yeah, enjoy <laughs> it late, York, right? Working hard, yeah. Yeah, I was working, uh, living in New York as well when he was there. And um, uh, that's how it was. And then when he moved to Boulder, he started working as a, a, a you know, sous chef or not even a chef, kind of the lowest of the low in the kitchen of a restaurant. And uh, he was getting paid $10 an hour. And sometimes he would forget to pick up his check, <laughs> but uh, but he just was willing to put in those hours and work long days. And it's it's that work ethic, right? Uh, that's one thing that uh, you say by working harder you get luckier. But I've seen this, you know, with all your children, Tosca as well. She works so hard, hard. countless yeah. hours, right? Countless hours. I've had to babysit. I mean, stay. Well, first of all. I moved to LA because she was having twins and then she said, bring your dog. I said, no, no, I'm just, I was living in New York for 13 years. I said, oh no, I, I don't need to bring our dog. I'm only coming for a week. Bring your dog. You know how persistent she is. Yes. Brought my dog. And fortunately I did. Otherwise I would have gone back to New York. I would miss my dog too much. And uh, actually my other one is here. Running around somewhere. <laughs> oh, there are a little gold. You got a sweetheart just relaxing there in the sofa. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He loves me being home. And uh, so then I brought my dog and she had her twins. And then I actually ended up staying with her for eight months to help her with those twins. And then uh, now when she travels for movies, say she has to do two weeks in Italy or, or just away, then, then I will stay at her home. And she will have a nanny in the day. I'll take them to school in the morning, but she'll have a nanny in the day when they come back from school so that I could still get my work done. But uh, pretty much when I, um, when I saw you, you know, I was going to, I had flights booked every week yes. for my book promotion and for speaking engagements and modeling jobs every yeah. week. It's and quite a pace. Kept- it's quite a pace you've kept up. Now you do that again by uh, staying in shape, by eating well. What, the, yeah. what do you expect the calendar to look like? I guess you'll resume uh, the same uh, sort of pace once, uh, once COVID-19 lifts its claws, right? The, cl- the clutch of its claws on us. It could go slowly. First of all, I'm sure they wouldn't want to fill the planes. I'm sure speaking. Yeah. Engagements might still be remote. People wouldn't want to sit too close together. I also think people aren't going to be shaking hands and hugging. Yeah. You know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of fear when we start connecting with each other again. Yeah, maybe as you say, it'll start to start slowly, right? As we sort of lift our heads up, start to expose ourselves a little bit, then hopefully before too long, we are on the other side of this because it's, yeah. you know, it's taking it out of us. Yes. Well, uh, I'm keeping very busy. Well, first of all, podcast. Yay. Yes. You're promoting the book, of course. Yes. <laughs> showing my book to everybody, you know, <laughs> and uh, because of course the bookstores are closed, but uh, online is fine. Audible, yeah, the, the audio book, the eBooks, they're doing very well. And uh, the, you just got to keep on getting out there. Yeah. Keep talking it right. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, you talk about this in the book as well, but just knocking on doors, saying hello, uh, networking, all of those doors. things. Yeah. 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 So where are the places, where are the best places to find the book? We'll have all this in the show notes and everything as well. But for those listening, where's the best, where are the best places to pick up the book if you're not in a bookstore right now? Well, Indigo in Canada is really mm-hmm. good. Uh, if you go to uh, my website, maymust.com, and you go to author and you can see where you can order it in Canada and it is, and, and in the USA, and um, it's already been, uh, I've had contracts offered in 20 countries to be translated. I'm very excited about that. So we will announce it as they become available. Of course, many countries have also been delayed because of lockdown mm-hmm. and the publishing houses are not publishing, of course, aren't printing books. So um, 
there's a, there are delays there, but uh, there'll be some great announcements as the books become available in different countries. But uh, pretty much at the moment, it's Canada and the USA. And it's just, you can choose then from which online store you want to buy a book. Fantastic. Well, as I say, uh, we'll have that in the show notes as well. Your website's great. So you'll, you'll keep things uh, current on the website as well, obviously, so people can find that, right? Yes. We, I've, I've, and that's what I've been spending time on as well, updating it, getting all the latest um, uh, articles as well. You know, the press, there's been a lot of press before the close, the lockdown. And uh, you just don't stop working. Now I'm working on Dropbox because <laughs> to 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 uh, um, scan all my photos from many years ago. Oh, good. And I've, today I posted two from 40, 40 years ago when I modeled in New York. So th- that's um, you know you just uh, you just come across these things and you might as well sort out everything you've ever wanted to sort out in your home. Oh, that's great! And you know your your true to form work ethic, right? To just keep uh, keep at things. Is, uh, is obviously uh, a, a trait that uh, will continue with you to the, to the end of the days. I can't get over your, your internet presence as well, your Instagram and your followers. I mean, your message is resonating with people as it always has. Again, going back to when we were you know, young and in school, uh, your message resonated with us back then, and it's still resonating with the kids these days, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yes. And I get uh, teenagers who just uh, are so thrilled with my Instagram account, and they also love my book. And uh, uh, that's always, um, yeah, well, it's, it's, for, it's for men and for women, although it's a woman makes a plan. It's also men are liking it for, of course, the adventure, going to the Kalahari Desert, you know, sleeping with lions and hyenas and things like that. And then also the business part, because I've lectured around the world at universities mm-hmm. for, on how to run your own business as a wellness professional, because that, I always ran my own business, but mainly because... I work from home so that my children, mm-hmm. I, I could be there for the kids. And then yeah, when I had modeling jobs, I'd have somebody to look after them. You, you really, you know, you worked with what you had, very enterprising. And, you know, you describe in the book, you know, working hard, being lucky as you work hard. But I think there's actually a mindset. And this is one thing I wanted to discuss with you. I've noticed it throughout my life. I think people are drawn to each other. I think that good people find each other. And there's a mindset for the ones that click and start to work together. And I've seen this, obviously, I'm great friends with Kimball, your son with Tosca, so your daughter you with Elon. With too? What made you go to Zip2? Kimball, of course, in his <laughs> ever persuasive way. Yes, I mean, uh, persuasive. Per, I mean, what, wonderful and always in the right way, his heart in the right place, you know, and making, making the world a better place, right? He would reach, he reached out and he said, look, there, I, uh, as he graduated uh, from business school, uh, mm-hmm. we were at Queens together. I got into law school. So I went directly to law school from that. He, of course, started the company with Elon. And, uh, and Greg Curry, our dear, dear friend, Greg Curry, uh, and he would continue to send messages about how well it was going. And I kept saying, well, I'm in law school. I'm in law school. And he said, you got to get down here. You got to start taking part of this. Of course he was right as he always is. And I came down to join. And that's where, again, I guess where we, uh, renewed, uh, our, uh, uh, our relationship because you, I think you joined, no, you were down, I think you were already down there when I got down there. I think you were living in San Francisco. Is that right? Yeah. You had that, you had that apartment up in San Francisco. Yes, yes. Well, first of all, um, uh, I lived, uh, I moved to, uh, they wanted me to move there. They said, I said, I can't move. I've just had a book coming out in, in, in Canada. And uh, then um, they said, yes, but this time we have an income. You, you, you know, you don't have to struggle so much. And so then I sold my practice in Toronto and I moved mm-hmm. to, to Mountain View. And, you know, no mountain, no view. No mountain. I was in the apartment and... I never saw them because, you know, they work day and night. That's right. Yeah. So then uh, I said, okay, I'm going to just die of boredom here and nobody's going to notice for weeks. Because <laughs> I see anybody. So then I said to my kids, I'm going to go to San Francisco to look for an apartment. But of course, I didn't have a credit rating in, in mm-hmm. the USA. So then I would wear a suit, look very smart every day, and I would have the... Um, my bank, my Canadian bank accounts, as well as my uh, Canadian credit card. And then I would I put some money into the bank in, in America, which, you know, it's hard to even open a bank account. Yes. And then I would have the, the bank certify that I can pay rent. And uh, I would go with this to every 
like about eight places a day to rent a place. And each one said, your credit rating is not good. Your credit mm -hmm. rating is not good. And eventually somebody said, well, if you use your credit card, then you can, my Canadian credit card, you can pay rent at this furnished apartment, one bedroom apartment in San Francisco. And that's how I managed to get a place to to live. And that was the I guess that uh, that first place I recall we had a uh, we were talking about this in Boulder recently. We had a, a wine party there one night. Do you remember that? How we okay. well, covered the labels? Yes. Well, th that was when I moved to a studio apartment. First of all, I was there, and it was two thousand dollars a month for a, a furnished apartment, mm -hmm. which. Um, it, I thought it was expensive, but I mean, if they would take my credit card. <laughs> that was the main thing I could find a home. <laughs> and so it was quite nice. But then, uh, then actually, uh, it just was too expensive. So, and uh, my practice didn't pick up quick enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then I moved to the corner of Leavenworth in California to that studio apartment, you know, the bedroom. That's the, the one, yes. The, the, the sofa bed and a tiny... Uh, uh, um, a friend of mine sold me a bed for $200 because it was a $500 bed and she doesn't need it anymore. Sold it to me for $200. And then another friend gave me a small desk. They, they were going to upgrade their desk. So a small desk fit in there. And then I got a sofa bed so the kids could always have somewhere to, to sleep. So that was that room. Yes. <laughs> a tiny kitchen and a tiny bathroom. And so then I thought, but it didn't stop me partying. I still wanted to have fun. And everybody would brag about wine. I don't drink wine. So they, this one's better and this one's better. Yes. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to do from the very expensive to the cheapest. I'm going to put numbers on them. I'm not going to do them in order. And people are going to taste them and tell me which are the tastiest. And you know, the second cheapest got the best taste. Mm -hmm. the ex most expensive got, I mean, like a $20 most expensive, a $6 the least expensive. So... Um, so it wasn't that the most expensive was the best tasting. And then I just proved my point. <laughs> exactly. And we had a great time doing that, as you say, and, and proved that point. Great time. <laughs> you'd always, yeah. you'd always, you know, there's always seemed like there's always like a moral. There was always a lesson, you know, to eat right, to, to, to be healthy, to be wise, to be happy. Always like that. And you've instilled that in the kids, obviously, and all the people they attract around them. I think a lot of people are interested. I know you get a lot of questions about how do you, how do you inspire young leaders and how do you inspire business people? I mean, what would you say to people and how would you describe what you've done with your own kids? Well, the thing is, you need to mix with people that are nice. Now, I, I've, I've mixed with people that are not nice and I've tried to change them. And you can't change them when no. they are basically evil, you know, just malicious. In that, and you try to change. So you, you suffer through that. You, you suffer a lot, all right, when you, when, you, when you trust evil people. But you know from the beginning... So that's it. If you're in a bad situation, like in your office or in your home, you need to change things and it can be scary and it is scary and you lack confidence, but you need to, to move on and move to a happier spot. So when I moved to Toronto and took Elon and Tosca and, and me um, three weeks to clean up that apartment and then we could I could just pay for the carpet because then we can sleep on it, you know, yeah. and then... And then over time, you know, beds and then couch. And then actually, remember, did, did you ever meet Jops, my German boyfriend? And he actually gave me for a birthday present a dining room table. I remember chair. him. That's right. I remember yeah. him. Yeah. And he was really generous. He wasn't wealthy, but he was generous. And it, it was at one of those tables that you put together. So yeah. IKEA table. We got a dining room table. And we also had his, uh, the kid's birthdays in his backyard barbecue there because uh, I couldn't afford birthday parties. And uh, so, um, you know, you just, you just always in, feel fortunate about everything you have. If you can afford a roof over your head and food in your stomach, you know, and enough you know, clothes to stay warm, <laughs> you just need one coat, you just need one coat, uh, then uh, you should be happy. Yeah, that's just it, right? It's, and that's going back to what I was saying is the mindset because you've always expressed that happiness, always demonstrated that happiness. Uh, uh, and as you say, you don't have to be extremely wealthy to be happy. If you, if you have enough to, to feed your belly and feed, the, you know, feed those that you love uh, and you're able to spend that time together, that's enough. That's the beginnings of it. And that's what you've always done, haven't you? You've always done that and you've taught that to all those around you, your kids obviously, and those that they invite into their lives because that's the way that we live. When we get together, there's an awful lot of happiness. There's an awful lot of laughing, isn't there? 
Yes, uh, um, that's true. And that's why you've stayed friends so long with the family. You're just always welcome because it's always joyful to see you, you know, and that's, that's, um, that's how we work. <laughs> that's how it actually is, right? It really is the good people. And we, and we lift each other. We all lift each other. It's so nice to be a part of that. Uh, I've always felt welcome. I've always enjoyed being a part of it. And when I talk about that mindset, there's a different way of thinking I find as well. Certainly happiness, certainly coming from the right place. I mean, Kimball, you can, it, it just exudes from him. Oh, uh, doesn't he? I know he really does. He's, he's, um, from the beginning, he's just been joyful and considerate of others. Always considerate of others. Yes. He really has. You know, Tosk as well, very much so. Always, you know, and storytelling and create the creativity with Tosk is so wonderful, obviously, to always see that. Yes. And, uh, yeah, well, as a, when I was at the University of Toronto, I was a research officer, so the kids could all come there and study either medicine or law um, virtually for free. I think it was for free because I was on staff. Uh -huh. And, you know, and uh, they all chose their own way, so they had to find their own scholarships and their own loans, and, and uh, that's up to them. And they were responsible for themselves, and, and they wanted up. what they loved to do, not mm -hmm. what I... Well, I would only want them to do it because it was free. <laughs> I no, could but afford you, it. <laughs> but you, and you encouraged them to run with what they, what they felt yes. passionate about. You know, Elon's obviously notorious for that, right? A, 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 oh, yeah. a, a relentless work ethic to, to, to bring yes. his vision to fruition, right? We continue yes. to see that. It's amazing to watch. I mean, I'm sure, that, I'm sure you could never have imagined that where each of them have gone, they would, they would have gone when you, were, when you were watching them as young children. Yes. No, you, you have no clue when they're young children, what are they going to be capable of when, when they're older? And that they will actually, even if they're brilliant and a genius, a genius and two brilliant children, <laughs> they don't always, um, they can live in a basement and just be brilliant and not, not, have in, not be able to share it with the world. And yeah, fortunately, my, my kids do. And yeah, they've been able to share. Yeah, absolutely. And they'll be sharing you know, through uh, mediums yeah. such as this. I, yes. I, I think it extends beyond, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, your immediate, your immediate family. I recall visiting your sister Kay uh, yes. when she was in Canmore uh, yes. in, in, uh, in Alberta uh, with, I think I was there with Kimball and uh, her son, one of her sons, Russ, at the time. We were traveling, oh, right. visiting. Yeah. Huh. And the conversations were very similar. And it was very, it's still very jovial. Yes. Always happiness, always laughter, and always thinking business as well. We would always talk oh, yeah. business and different business ideas. She, 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 well, first of all, she's a hermit completely. She doesn't want it. Yeah. You know, she doesn't want me to talk. Well, she doesn't mind me talking about her. Don't, don't talk. Don't say where she lives. Don't give out any information about her. And we FaceTime every night and she laughs at how hard I'm working and doing all sorts of things. And, and, um, she just reads, she just watches the business news uh -huh. and she knows what's, what's going on with her business. So she works with her, her shares and her stocks and her savings and all this so that, um, She's always on top of business, so she can always give me advice that way. But she has the funniest laugh, the loudest. <laughs> yes. And uh, I always say, um, yeah, when we walk into a room, I might as well sit in the corner knitting because everybody just wants to hang around her because she's so much, she really says it as it is. I mean, she, she has no barriers. <laughs> and uh, people just love her company. Yeah, very much so. And that's, you know, as you described, that sounds a little bit like her son, uh, son Russ as well, right? He'll just tell yeah. it like it is, but boy, is yeah. he ever fun to be around. It's fun. All her uh, four kids are fun and we love spending time together. You talk a lot about, uh, and you know, you know f family and friends relationships, right? Uh, ensuring that you have wonderful relationships. What have you done to foster great relationships over the course of your life? And what are you, what are you continuing to do to make sure they're so, that they're so wonderful? And um, when I meet people who are good people, I just make them my friends. And, uh, but then I, I have had people that are not nice. And then I would say, well, come to the party. Just don't be so negative. Just be pleasant to people. Look, you're beautiful. You dress well. You're wealthy. You're well-educated. So just share your joy with other people and, uh, and, and come to a party. And then you'll see that, that life is fun. And then she'll come to the party and she'll grab people and tell them how miserable she is. And I'll say, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Yeah, but my life is hell. I said, your life isn't hell. You're a very fortunate woman. And I mean, and for men too, it would be the same. And I would try and talk to him. And eventually I'll say, I can't invite you anymore. I just can't. You, you, just, you just grab people and pull them down. You know? Yeah, well, they don't, you know, unfortunately adhere to what, 
is the way that you exude that, that sort of warmth, right? The, the, the type of people that attract each other, the ones that are exuding that and, and are happy and positive. Because what happens is those happy, positive people attract more happy, positive people, don't they? Definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, even when we saw each other recently, how many happy, positive people were there? I mean, everybody. Yeah, Everyone yeah. Was. And it yeah. makes it all, it lists, it lists all. You tell a nice story in, in your book, and this is true for everybody. You tell a nice story about how uh, you were at a party and you saw Miss Universe, right? And yeah. she was keeping to herself. Uh, and well, why don't you go on and tell, tell the story and the lesson that can be learned yeah. from that? Yes, well, what happens is because... Um, when, when I won my beauty competition, I remember nobody would talk to me and all this, and I'm just standing there. So when uh, I had the modeling school in Bloemfontein, which is a small university town, Afrikaans university town, and uh, um, they said, Miss Universe is arriving, can you bring your students? Because I did this modeling school for the Dietetic Scholarship Fund. Will you bring the students with you so that you can greet her? So I said, fine. So we come, I bring about 10 students and we're standing there. And she's standing there and I'm thinking, well, I mean, she's just standing alone and nobody's talking to her. So I came over to her and I just said to her, um, is it okay if we come and greet you? Because, uh, you know, we are waiting for someone to introduce us. She says, oh, thank you so much for talking to me. I'm standing here all alone and, and I don't know what to do because I'm waiting for, for my manager to go and sort out the luggage. So I, so I came and brought her over and then, uh, and funny enough, then I even have a picture of Tosca sitting on her lap when we went to her event <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. So she, you know, you just can't judge people from far. And what I learned is that when I go to new cities, I've lived in eight cities in uh, three countries, that I would go to as many events and uh, meetings as possible. And that in the beginning, no one talks to you. And I would always say, all right, I'll go to an event. And if no one talks to me for 30 minutes, okay, I'll, I'll just move away. And um, somebody would always. So then you would start meeting people and that would be a really kind person. And in the same way, if I'm at a, a party or if I'm at an event and I see someone standing alone, I will say to my friends, I just want to check if that person is alone or waiting for someone. And then I will go and I say, are you waiting for someone or do you want to join us? And then they'll say, Either, oh, I have someone coming, but can I join you in the meantime? That, because no one wants to stand alone. It's very stressful and, and you've, you feel awkward. And, I don't, and so you can see it in other people. So that's a nice way also to be kind to and considerate of others that is not just about you having fun it's about in, including other people and they may or may not become your friends but it doesn't matter just as long as you know that you don't there's not somebody feeling sad on their own i have watched you do that many times i've watched kimmel do that i've watched tosca i've watched your uh, uh, nephews do that as well there's something that warmth right including people and then everybody has a good time as a consequence and a lot of people end up being very good friends as a consequence Yes, yes, yes. And that's what the, uh, when I, at my 70th birthday party in New York, I had it in New York and in LA, a 70th one in New York, uh, someone I just met, it's actually my book agent. <laughs> she, I just met her and she wanted me to write a book. And uh, uh, so she, I invited her because she was in New York and, and the party was coming and she just said to me, everyone here is just nice. Mm -hmm. They are all so nice. And that was the only qualification of my friends. They had to be nice. Yeah. 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 And it, it really is. And you know, it, it, it a good begets good. It's, it's not, I mean, people may read a bunch of things about you and your children and all those, just all this world changing events, really. Sure. Of course. But down at the base, these are good people, as you say, and you've instilled that and you attract good people for that reason. Don't you? Yes. 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 Uh, so for, uh, you say uh, your 70th, what's the next, what's the next five years look like for you? What else is, is the book you're promoting right now? What's the, what else is on the agenda for May Musk? Well, as I say, let's hope, um, I know some of the talks I was booked, they've been moved to next year. Some have been moved till August, September. Um, modeling jobs, I, I don't know when they'll start coming back again. Um, but you know, I'm just going to carry on um, posting on, on social media, which is where my work comes from, and uh, see when it takes us. Yeah, and that's always been the way, hasn't it? Uh, you say, mm -hmm. make a plan. But the reality is you've always just worked hard and good things have happened because of that. You mm -hmm. invite good things in your life, they actually happen. And then you follow through, right? You've mm -hmm. been doing this for years. You've picked up what well, you described, eight different cities, right? Uh, it was fascinating to read through the book and think about and being there for the moves to think, 
but how difficult that can actually be and what it takes to reestablish and reestablish again. And you've always done that with wonder and, and in a wonderful way. What would you say to people listening that are contemplating a move or contemplating a shift in their business or in their career right now? Do it. So you, why not? What's stopping you? Can you go back if you fail or um, what is scaring you? Just live, live for what you could do in the future and just, be careful and be aware of things, work hard at it. And uh, I mean, with, I've seen my kids work so hard and it's been so painful for them too, you know. They've been through very painful times mm -hmm. of uh, nearly losing their businesses and um, getting backlash, of course, especially if you fight the fossil fuel industry. Yes. <laughs> Choose them, I mean, really. <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, but if you have a good, good plan that will be better for the world and for America or for uh, mainly for the world, they do good stuff. Tosca's Passion Flex goes worldwide. Kimball's Big Green, which is the vegetable gardens in schools, mm -hmm. that, that can go worldwide. People can do it in every country. And then Elon with uh, Tesla, as well as with SpaceX, it's, uh, that's beyond. Yeah, that's it really is, but making a difference, coming from the right place, as you say, for, despite what some people may say, it, it's coming from the right place. These are people that are very thoughtfully trying to make the world a better place. Kimball, yeah. especially, has talked about how he's thought long and hard about this after he was hurt, right? Thought long and hard about oh, this yeah. to, to, to make a difference in the world. You know that Elon's doing the exact same thing uh, with yeah. his thinking, and so is Tosco. So they've done this very consciously, using the things that you've taught them along the way to, to bring their dreams to their passions to fruition. And you're doing the exact same thing yourself and only encouraging others to do it at the same time, aren't you? Well, the thing is, you know, what's working in my favor is my age because women over 70 are usually ignored, whereas men become CEOs and presidents, but women are ignored. And uh, they just feel that when I give my talks, it gives hope for women to be, to know that, they're just getting started because that's how I feel. I feel that um, the world is my oyster and I'm going to explore this whole world. I'm just loving it. I was loving all my travels and I'm, it's going to come back. And, it, uh, and I'll explore more, more countries and I'll give women more hope. It certainly will. You've, you really do bring that, May. It's, it's lovely to have you here uh, today and to talk about the book. It's very much, it brings to mind for those that are listening uh, you know, uh, the, current, the current type of book that we're seeing right now is something like, uh, from, you know, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules or uh, uh, I was thinking about How Well You Measure Life by Clayton Christensen. People that have stories to tell, but also wise words to offer along the way. Your book does that very much so, as you described for women, but really these are lessons that anybody can apply to their own life, aren't they? Anybody, yes. Many men have made changes and they've told me about it and they said it's just improved their lives. It really does. You know, it's a wonderful, positive message. Uh, I, I listened to it on Audible, and I have to say the added bonus was listening to your wonderful reading voice. Uh, I mean, you've, got a, you've always had a lovely accent, obviously. And for anybody listening here now, you're obviously enjoying your voice here, and obviously to hear you read the book is, is very nice. Okay, yes. Uh, um, they, they said to me, do I want to read my book? And I said, I insist on reading my book. I said, who else can speak my words? And... Uh, you know, and, and sound like me. So I, I read my book. Yeah, and, it's, and it came, came across perfectly. You're saying now all these other languages. How is it, uh, I guess there'll be people that have to translate it into other languages. Is that what's going to occur? They say, well, trans translate it into many different languages. And um, I'm, uh, I'm practicing more of my German, French, and Dutch, because, of course, those are the languages I speak, or Dutch Afrikaans. Uh, by by watching some uh, movies with the uh, <laughs> in these languages, that's what I'm watching. A lot of series with them, and uh, just to just to get those languages going, uh, so that when I go to those countries for the book promotions, that I can speak the languages. Are you? Uh, you're it. not thinking of reading your book in one of these other languages, are you? No, you know they say. Funny enough, when I speak French or German, they say I have a Dutch accent. Oh, okay. But, uh, because I'm fluent in Afrikaans. Yes, of course. And so when you're, but as you promote the book, uh, when you're going to the, so you'll actually promote it in other languages as well then? Well, I will, I will go to other countries. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I had some book tours in different countries ready to go and uh, that's all been canceled. Uh, oh, can postponed. postponed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, postponed, yeah. And well, I will I, be to different can countries, yes, to promote it. 
Yeah. So for those listening, do pick up the book. I've, I've seen it in the grocery store here, as I say, uh, uh, as I'm walking along. And then I didn't, I mentioned this to you when we were last in Boulder, but uh, it was sold out the last time I went back, if you can imagine. Yeah. So the book is moving off the shelves. Okay. Which is good. <laughs> yeah, that's what we want to hear, obviously. So uh, again, you have a lot of wonderful uh, advice in the book for people, uh, you know, a lot of nice things that uh, people can take with them, carry them through their day. Uh, if we were to sum up one uh, for the purpose of this podcast, I'd like to end these podcasts by um, sort of giving people listening something to take with them through the rest of the day, uh, something that, uh, um, you know, that they, might, that they might think about for the rest of their day, maybe their, their, their week that will uh, improve their lives and maybe the, the lives of those around them. Can you, I mean, I know you get a lot of really nice things in the book, but is there, is there maybe one thing you can leave this podcast with that uh, someone listening might take from and might uh, share with somebody else to make the world a better place? Um, make a change and, and explore and make the world a better place. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, mean, you know. I haven't thought of just one thing to say. Um, a woman makes a plan just means if things go wrong, you make a plan. Yeah, you do. You work hard. You make yeah. you make it, and, and it doesn't mean that it's a straight line, does it? It might be okay. something that you turn. And I've watched you adapt and overcome. And I mean, with all the business uh, things that uh, have occurred as well, you've been something that's there, and with a positive message saying, "Let's work through this one as well." Right? Yes. With, when I said I was writing a book, Elon Kimball and Tosca said to me, "You've got to talk about your struggles because, mm -hmm. of course, I'm Instagram perfect." <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to look perfect, isn't it? But the reality is you get right into it in the book and describe how, you know, there's been a lot of struggle to get to this point as well. It's not all ups, it's peaks struggle. and valleys. Yes, peaks and valleys. And, uh, and sometimes when you are in the valleys, you, you're just in this dark tunnel and you think you can't get out, but you've got to keep crawling out. You mm -hmm. just have to plan to get out of that bad situation. And you, it could go into a scary situation and economically usually it's a problem, you know, and it's still worth it to be away from a bad situation. Yeah, you, you know, I want to just take a second uh, uh, and thank again you for your honesty in the book because uh, you described some pretty dark times there as well. Um, I've heard uh, each of your children describe your ex uh, and uh, um, they, would never, they didn't ever say very much about him and you were pretty open and pretty honest about talking about how I mean, it was a pretty miserable time there and how you had to overcome that as well. And I know you were doing that from what Elon and Tosca and Kimmel were saying is tell the struggles as well. Make sure people understand because there's lessons to be learned from those, aren't Even the tough times, there's lessons to be learned, aren't there? Yes. And, and when, when I read my book with the final edit, I just said, maybe we should take out some of those tough times because they're pretty rough. And, and then my editor said, there are many women going through that mm -hmm. kind of uh, relationship. And just to give them hope that they, they can get out of it. And, uh, and it is scary, but it's, to live in fear every day, it's not a way to live. And you need to, uh, you know, I stayed married for the sake of my children, then I got divorced for the sake of my children. And uh, I always wanted a happy home after that. Yeah, and you always have, May. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, you always have, as I say, I, I love reading the book because as I say, I uh, was there for a lot of the times. And I appreciate how you shared what you were thinking and feeling at the time. You always exuded outward warmth and confidence and uh, uh, you were always very vivacious. You always are. Uh, but it's nice to know that you have the same kind of uh, insecurities that we all do, right? And you're more than willing to share that. And I think that people reading the book will gain strength from that, understand that they're not alone if they're going through a difficult time. Right, right. Yeah, so, no, it's, um, we all go through difficult times. And as you say, if you know that other people go through it, but they don't talk about it, because my twin sister, hey, and as well as my two brothers, they were surprised when they, and shocked when they read my book and they said, you went through all that hell and you didn't tell us. And I said, nobody tells people. Mm -hmm. Women in abusive relationships don't talk to anyone about it. And then they also were surprised at how I was financially strapped, but I never complained and never asked to borrow money. And I said, it never occurred to me. Even my mom, before she died, she said, um, why did you never tell me you were you know, in such financial problems? Well, I never went into debt, but I just didn't have money to spend. And, uh, and I said, but I was responsible for myself. It never occurred to me, oh, you, can you give me money? Yeah, that didn't occur to me. No, and you describe you, that you are always, you know, willing to do the work. 
and yeah. do what it takes to make it happen. You've always done that, uh, even during, this, during the dark times. As I say, there's a lot to be inspired from, for the, from that. Uh, and it comes through very clearly. Your message, your voice comes through very clearly in the, in the book. So can you tell us one more time how, uh, uh, I guess, through your website and uh, the best ways to reach uh, out to find you uh, so that uh, anybody listening, if they might be inspired or want to uh, speak further on any of these points, they might be able to get in touch with you? Well, there's always social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And then there's uh, maymust.com. And you'll see there's my, um, all, all the different, if it's speaking engagement, if it's a um, literary agent, if it's my model agent, and then if it's my assistant. And you can get through to all of them. So lots of different ways to find you, of course, yeah. uh, and lots of different ways to work with you as well. You are always doing so much. I don't anticipate you're going to be slowing down at any point. Is there any uh, chance that uh, Tosca will be uh, making a movie about you or this book someday? About me? <laughs> she actually makes movies of best-selling romance novels, so definitely <laughs> my book. <laughs> That's one thing I wasn't successful at. You tell yeah. that very nicely in the book, though, as well, don't you? You just say that look, if, if you meet somebody that makes you better and you have a great time with them, great. But if not, you can do it on your own as well. And you've always done that as well. Yes. Yes. I've met some, you know, I date somebody and it make it better. And then it didn't make it better. And you, may, you became sad. And then it's time to move on. And I would stay in those relationships too long and be, be very hurt. And then, find, and then decide, okay. Uh, I can't, I don't want to live in sadness. Yeah, enough is enough, of course. Yeah, because that's just not your way. Now, would you say that you're hard to date yourself? Would you be somebody that'd be hard to date, do you think? Me, hard yeah. to date? Well, if you're intelligent, uh, it would be easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, the challenge is finding an intelligent person, right? <laughs> no, just, I don't know. Um, I, I, like, I like interesting men. Uh, not men who are uh, complain about their their, uh, their horrible lives and are miserable. I used to meet a lot of men who, who complained about their lives and I said, that's not fun. No, 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 that's not fun at all. You are so positive. You need somebody positive and uplifting. And as, as yeah. you say, if you can find someone that can match you as an equal, then you're better off. And you, carry, you always carried on and made everyone around you a better person as a result. Oh, good. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's, nice here. <laughs> that's right. That's why we're able to connect. Right. So that's why we always have may. I can't tell you how thrilling it is to have you on the show. I know that the, our listeners have gained a lot from this. I know that they will because your message is so positive. And a lot of people hear, you know, what Elon's done, what Kimmel's done, what Tosca's done, what you've done. Right. And, and, the, and the strides you're making now in your own business and your modeling career. And it only is going up from here, isn't it? It's only going up. Yeah. It's really going to be very exciting. So we uh, uh, talked about uh, getting through this COVID-19. We talked about your 70th uh, party, obviously. We look forward to celebrating the next big party. What's the next big one on the agenda? Well, I have one every five years. So at 75, you're going to have to fly to wherever I am having my party. How's yeah, that? <laughs> that sounds wonderful, wherever that may be. Well, May, I look forward to joining you at that party. I look forward to sharing this episode and continuing the conversation at some point in the future. Thanks so much for being on today. Thank you.